Leo Sayer is a singer, songwriter, musician and entertainer whose singing career has spanned five decades. With the world gradually emerging from a two-year hiatus, Leo is celebrating this milestone to great effect with a live performing schedule throughout 2022, along with a brand new album, Northern Songs. And he's with us here now, live from Australia. How are you doing today? <laughs> very good, very good. Except we just had, a, you're actually very lucky because we mm. just had a power cut. Wow. Because I live in the country between Sydney and Canberra, and uh, like two hours drive out of Sydney, about two hours drive to Canberra, so right in the middle. And we're in an area called the Southern Highlands, which is kind of as as tall as the Cairngorms. So it's a, wow. it's like, um, yeah, quite high up. And um, when it's dark here, it's really dark. And this is winter yeah. now. Oh, yeah. So you can see me wearing layers here. It's kind of, it's getting colder and colder. But it was peculiar tonight. And all of a sudden, when I thought that they weren't going to put the power on until uh, 11 p.m. my time, and it's now 7.30, um, you know, we thought, oh, God, maybe I can't do this interview. But luckily, the power's just come on and everything's plugged in and ready right. to go. I had yeah. battery lights going and everything like <laughs> this and, you know, small little chargers like this kind of going for the. Yeah. But we're luckily, you know, that's yeah. that's it. Technology. We're all, you know, we're all we're all slaves to it now. Yeah, for sure. Now, this new album that you've got, yep. Northern Songs, Northern the songs, LP yeah. of it is going to be out next Friday. And it's sort mm -hmm. of an album of Beatles songs, but with a twist, right? Yeah, I just tried to Leo-fi them. In fact, I've got them. Should have, I should have go, I'll go over there in a minute and reach out for one. I can show <laughs> you. I've got the vinyl ones here because wow. uh, it's just literally just arrived. Um, here in, they sent some to Australia um, and it's a really nice package we had to do it as a double because there's so many songs on it um, it started off about 10 years ago um, I was kind of fooling around in the studio really learning how to do things for myself um, and and actually since then there's been another album since that you know initial time there was an album called Selfie which I made mm -hmm. but Covid made me turn back to this project because I'd already started it and um, we recorded Eleanor Rigby um, uh, practically the first few songs. Uh, Girl, I think. Um, 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 let me see. Uh, um, um, can't remember. Strawberry Fields Forever. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and and um, uh, Norwegian Wood. So I recorded those four first, just trying out my studio, seeing if I could work it by myself. And very, very luckily at that time, a guy who'd been important in my life before, a mixing engineer, John Hudson, who used to run Mayfair Studios in London. His wife is Australian, he's English, and they decided to elope to Australia and move just like I've done. Mm. And suddenly John turned up and I said, oh, hang on, have I got a project for you? So I gave him those four songs to mix and he did a brilliant job yeah. because, you know, although I can do all the recording myself, you still need that person to kind of finish it off and, you know, just fine tune things. So he's been an important part of the project. But as I say, when COVID came along, and, you know, suddenly there's the, you can't do gigs. I mean, here we had massive problems in Australia um, where, you know, basically the whole industry shut down because it's a big country, this, and you go state to state. And, you know, we've, we've just got we've got a change of government now, which is good news to us all. But honestly, the last government just left the Stoats to make up their, their, their own mind about things. So, you know, you'd go to, say, Perth, and there'd be different, uh, rules in Western Australia than they were to, you know. And the yeah. other thing is I was on an Irish tour um, in, uh, starting off um, in 2019 um, and we we couldn't complete it. So now we're able to complete it. Um, you know, we did the first few gigs and now we're able to complete that, you know. So, yeah. so COVID drove a hole into everything. And I thought, well, what can I do? Well, I've got the studio. Let's get on and let's refine it. And then... The ideas started coming in. I think I recorded 29 Beatles songs, actually. Yeah. And I decided to do them in a very different way. So stylistically, they're quite adventurous. You know, I mean, 
Ellen Rigby's got the beat of Billy Jean to yeah. it, for instance, you know, and and Can't Buy Me Love is slowed, you know, which was Can't Buy Me Love, you know, originally is yeah. slowed right down to an almost bluesy kind of thing. You know, uh, Norwegian Wood is 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 uh, is very jazzy and Nowhere Man is reggae. So, you know, things really I've tried to really change it up. And I thought I'd get a lot of problems doing it because <laughs> I thought. God, everybody's going to complain like mad, but it's been very positive, the reaction, you know, yeah. and um, and also it felt like because it's my 50th anniversary, I thought I'd like to do something different, you know, to celebrate it. And, um, you know, I'm, I've got another bunch of songs all lined up for a new album coming up soon. But at the same time, I thought, no, nah, let's do something, you know, different. Let's do something yeah. like special. And I've always loved the Beatles. So there it was, you know. Yeah. And was there a particular song on the album that was your favourite to record? Oh, God. Um, I love them all, really. It's a bit like, you know, when people ask me about my, my own hits and, uh, or, or songs, and, and, and it's very difficult to choose one because I'm a Gemini, you see, so I've got this chameleon-like brain that just switches from one thing to another. So I kind of enjoyed the fact that I could use different treatments for each song, you know, do them. I mean... Hey Jude, for instance, is almost like a Bob Dylan song at the at the way it starts, you know, like a, a typical like harmonica and acoustic guitar intro and then grows into something. Um, and and I, I don't think I've got a favourite, actually. I mean, some songs have turned out even better than I thought they would. So yeah. they become highlights. Like, I mean, I, I'm really happy with my version of Strawberry Fields Forever because it kind of grooves along. Um, and I and I really like um, a day in the life as well. It was quite adventurous to kind of change that, but that worked out pretty good as well. You know, so yeah. it's been a, a case of I've been as surprised as anybody else has. And and the funny thing is, while making it, I mean, I've played it to a few friends and friends of mine in the business here, and they've mostly been kind of first they go, "What's that? What? What?" You know, <laughs> and they can't believe it. And a lot of people don't even recognize it's me at the start. You know, but. Yeah. But it's been very interesting. I've had people compelling me to put it out. So they said, you've got to finish this. Because as I say, it started just as an experiment. And I thought, well, I'm just making this for me for a bit of fun to learn to do the studio, you know, to use the studio by myself. Um, and it turned out to be more. Yeah. And as well, you're heading out on a UK tour mm. this autumn. What can we expect from the tour? Is it some of this album maybe some new stuff or the classics or maybe even both. yeah it's a bit of everything really i mean we got to a point really about two years ago where we couldn't have a support band any longer because yeah. you can't fit all the songs in you know there's so many <laughs> songs but you know diehard members of the audience and and the real fans if you don't do some of the hits like i mean i'm, I'm having trouble fitting i can't stop loving you into the show at the moment yeah. and have you ever been in love and i've got to find a way to shoehorn them in you know yeah. um because there's so many other stuff to do i i think we're going to rehearse up about three or four of the beatles um songs for it and you know i always used to do let it be on the show before anyway yeah. um so we'll have those and we'll have to i think we'll have to kind of you know like say we're playing in one place um say we're playing in liverpool you know, we can we can put in song for Liverpool that won't be in the show for Manchester. Yeah. So we'll have to kind of mess it around <laughs> like that. It will be it will be interesting. Um, but, you know, it's a challenge to get everything in and, um, yeah. uh, you know, have all the favourites in there. Mm. So, as I say, it, it becomes a, like an almost two hour show every night. Yeah. And how excited are you to get back out on the road? Oh, it's great. I mean, I did a little charity gig this weekend. We have a, yeah. a thing called Support Act out here. So I flew over to Adelaide mm -hmm. where there was a bunch of Australian acts on the bill as well. Good friends and a great band. And I was singing four songs on that. And oh, boy, it was just so great to be working again. You know, for all the time that I've been sitting here thinking, oh, do I really want to go back to work? It's kind of comfortable here at home. You know, yeah. um, I've got my studio. I could just quite honestly give it all up and just stay here. But coming back to it, as I say, this weekend was fantastic. You know, just yeah. singing again was so great. And and now I'm chafing at the bit. Can't wait to get back. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the other side of that is I'm 74 now, so I have to kind of like conserve my energy quite a lot to do this job. But mm. I, I feel that my energy is good, you know, and I feel that I can still do it for a few years.
Yeah. You know, and there's still ideas, as I say, coming. You know, creatively, it feels like, yeah, the sky's the limit. Absolutely. And what are some of your favourite venues to play at? Oh, well, um, well, this time, I mean, you know, I love Birmingham Town Hall. That's a really goodie. Um, you know, it's just fantastic to play. Um, I think we're playing um, in uh, the Edinburgh Bridgewater Hall, which sounds great. Yeah. I've never been there. Um, I don't know, really. I mean, you know, I hanker back for the days when we used to play Hammersmith Odeon, now yeah. the Apollo, of course. Yeah. And um, I sort of, I still remember playing really, really big gigs. And I, I'm dying to do that again. I mean, give me a few festivals and I shine, yeah. you know, so, um, so I'm ready for Glastonbury. I really am. Mm. <laughs> and I could have I could have killed it at that at that Queen's Jubilee show. I know it oh, would yeah. have been great. I could just see how I could use all those stages. Yeah. I mean, I think Rod Stewart did a pretty admirable job, but, you know, mm. I could see how I could make it my place, you know. Yeah, that's what it was missing. A bit of Leo scene. That's what, yeah, missed a bit. <laughs> and it, me and a, maybe Cliff as well. I'm, I was, I noticed yeah. that. Why didn't they put Cliff on there? You know, yeah, come on. He was that's at the an pageant, though, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. He was there. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. In some way, yeah. And have your fans changed much over the years, aside from getting older? I mean, are younger people coming? They are. It's a very good question. Um, it, it has been, it, it's been peculiar to see, but over the last. I'd say five or six years, the audiences have been getting, you know, look, there's still the older people are diehard fans and, yeah. and people, our generation, of course, my generation that, you know, obviously want to celebrate and see the music that br they brought, they came into the world with, you know, the, the early songs that made their teenage years. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But the thing is, it's handing down, interestingly, to younger people. And I think it's probably because, you know, the Stones, Billy Joel, Bruce Springsteen, um, Paul McCartney, of course, Elton John, they're still out there, Queen, they're still out there working. Yeah. And I think that the, aud the younger audiences are kind of getting hip to it, you know, and thinking, mm. hang on, these old devils, I nearly said old fuckers, um, <laughs> they really can play, you know, like, I mean, you'd see Niall Rogers up there playing guitar. And I mean, he's the king of the disco era and yeah. nobody plays guitar like Niall. So none of mm. the younger guitarists can do what he does. So that's what you see. And that's, I think that's what excites young people. The energy is still from us guys. And although, you know, most of like the who used to write, hope I die before I get old. Yeah. Um, you know, we all thought that music was only a young man's game, but we're finding out now that the old fellas can cut it as well. So, you know, I'm probably biased towards that thing, but um, <laughs> but but it's true. It's true. You don't lose it. You know, mm. you you as long as you've got the energy and the good enough health to compete, then we do compete, you know. Yeah. And you often come across on stage as if you have a lot of energy and you're having a great time. Is there a secret yeah. behind that or do you just love what you do? I think I love what I do. I mean, I just wake up, you know, when the opportunity's there. It's mm. it's quite quite fantastic. It's like, um, you know, you get on stage and you suddenly you're home, mm. and that's it. I mean, I'm writing my book at the minute, and the last chapter, um, I'm I'm getting close to the last chapter now, and the mm. last chapter will be the, you know, I'm going to set it to just before I go on stage on this British tour. Wow. So so I'm just about to walk on stage and the feeling is, you know, that, wow, this is what I do. This is how yeah. I describe myself. Because I've got friends who I know socially who don't know what I do. You know, mm. you meet them and and also because of COVID, we've not had a chance, much of a chance to prove it, you know. So they say, oh, I'd love to come and see one of your shows. And then they come along and they go, Oh my God, that's what you do. Yeah. And it all comes together, you know, suddenly that's your point of existence, you know, that's mm. your reason for existence. And it's very powerful. And yeah. um, I, I, I tend to just walk on there and find myself, you know, that's the, that's the real answer. I don't prep too much. For, I don't get nervous. Mm. I just kind of find myself at the venue. We check it all out, do the sound <laughs> check, check out where the areas are, you know, check, get confident with the room. Uh, the sound of the room, the look of the room, you know, and then it's all up for grabs when you walk on stage. And it's 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 beautiful because you build something. Yeah. And maybe you build in a little bit of trade as well, where the audience feel like they're on stage by the time you've finished and you feel like you're in the audience. <laughs> so it's yeah. that lovely exchange, you know, it's a it's a fantastic conversation that goes on. 
Yeah. And let's have a look at a few locations here. It starts in Chatham on the 22nd of September, then Worthing, London, Milton Keynes, Guildford, Scunthorpe, uh, Whitley Bay, York, Holmfirth, Buxton, Mm -hmm. Bradford, Perth, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Newark, Eastleigh, Basingstoke, Shanklin, (laughs) Southend-on-Sea, Bury St Edmunds, Wimburn, Yeovil, Weston Supermare, Manchester, Shrewsbury, Swindon, Glasgow and Liverpool. I don't think we miss anything out. I think that's basically everywhere, isn't it? There's no excuse not to come. I don't think so. I mean, there's already, (laughs) you know, look, there's always people who write on Facebook. Why aren't you coming to, you know, (laughs) you know, why aren't you coming to Portsmouth? Well, Southampton's just down the road, you know, and and I would have loved to have played Brighton because basically even more than Worthing, Mm. because I come from Sussex, you know, originally Shore and I see a town in between the two, those two cities. And, um, I would have loved to have played Brighton, but there's no venues apparently, you know, there so that are perfect. So we end up playing Worthing yet again. <laughs> so there's always a bit of compromise with venues. That's what I'm trying to say. There's yeah. you end up with a few places that you go, oh no, not that one again. I would have liked to have played. You know, but but that's that's life, you know. You just get it. It it happens, you know. And I and I think that over the last few years, the beach tours that I've done, um, we have managed to kind of like play everywhere, you know. Mm. It's fun to know that we're going to Aberdeen this time, you know, yeah. and it's nice to, uh, we haven't been able to announce it yet. Hush, hush. But <laughs> the first gig actually won't be Chatham. The first Ooh. gig will be in Truro, Ooh. but they won't let us announce it yet. They've got some funny rule that it has to be announced in a month's time or so. So anyway, <laughs> tip right. off to the re- tip off to the listeners. You can, <laughs> you can see us there, you know, the viewers. Um, yeah. And and just before that, I'm doing the rest of this Irish tour that was postponed as well. So oh, yeah. we've got like four or five dates in Ireland, which will be great. So Belfast and Cork and Dublin included. Yeah. Are you doing one day in Belgium as well, kind of in between? We are. Yeah, we're doing a weird one in Ostend that a uh, promoter <laughs> has kind of offered to us. And one in Spain as well. Oh, nice. Yeah, we're going to Spain. So I think it's in Marbella or somewhere oh, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, for all the expats. I've been out there before and that's a lot of fun because yeah. these people come out of the woodwork and they know all your songs. They sing along. It's just great, you know. Mm. And you can probably tell that I want to ask you You've got you the Muppets about, up there, yeah. yeah a particular <laughs> highlight in your career back in 1978. <laughs> what was it like to be on the Muppet Show? Well, I, I'd, I'd worked on Sesame Street originally, you know, which, which was the, the godfather of the Muppets. And Jim Henson... Um, you know, used to do that. And um, he and um, uh, his mate were the voices of Bert and Ernie and all those yeah. people, you know, and Grover and Kermit the Frog, of course. And so so I'd worked with Jim before, you know, and I knew the whole kind of concept and I loved the concept. You know, that was when I was in America and I walked into their studio in Philadelphia and they said, right, you're on. <laughs> that was it. I was just included in a show straight off, you know, only I, I was just visiting as a fan and, and that's what it became. So when they moved to London and started doing the Muppets with Lou Grade, Lord Grade yeah. at ATV Studios with this, you know, everybody thought, is this going to work or not? I already knew them. So, I mean, I was down there from day one and they were trying to put me on the show immediately. I don't think I made the first series because mm. they wanted some bigger names. And that's mm. that's cool, you know. But I was I was around there watching in the background while Julie Andrews and people like Vincent Price were on, you know. And yeah. you, you, you might have even seen me in the back dressed as a Muppet or something <laughs> with the hair, you know. <laughs> but um, we eventually, yeah, got around to doing it. And then I did a Julie Andrews show with them for American TV. And that yeah. was funny. Julie Andrews and the Muppets and me. Um, and then I, I, th- I think we did a few other things. I, I was on the Johnny Carson show, um, duetting with Miss Piggy <laughs> when Kermit the Frog was hosting. So, yeah, we had a kind of, you know, with Jim, uh, who I miss very much. I mean, we used to drive around in his Kermit green colored uh, um, uh, Lotus Elan. Yeah. You know, which was which was really good fun. Um, but I miss Jim and I, I knew them very well. You know, they were part of my family as well, you know. Yeah. And is it true that you were the last person to speak to Elvis? It is. It is something that I didn't believe myself when it actually happened because mm. I'd fallen off stage. This was 1977. Yeah. And I fell yeah. a humongous fall, about 25 feet onto concrete. Um, and I was very, very lucky that I didn't break any bones, but I got a bit of delayed shock. Um, and 
I kept having to go to hospitals, you know, for a, I, uh, look, it had made headline news, the, mm. the fall. So naturally the audience kind of more audience came to the shows and the, the tour had to go on, you know, yeah. who wrote that song. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I had to keep doing this tour, you know, because the business is going like crazy, but we got as far as Memphis and I locked up in the dressing room and I was in a ball and I couldn't get out of it. And they had, they found a guy there who was an ex uh, American football player. And, you know, those guys kind of, they do all their, <laughs> they, they do all their training themselves. You know, if, if one of them gets a, head locked or something like that they they treat themselves you know so this guy was had become a really good trainer physical trainer you know and um he took me under his wing he came backstage found me and said i know what to do with him and he took me away to his little place in huntsville which is about 80 miles away from memphis and we started working on me and i said what are you doing here and he said well i work for a big guy in town you know um and i can't tell you who it is you know sworn to secrecy and and then like uh about i had one more day to go there with him and before he was gonna put me on the plane back to la completely cured yeah. fixed you know and and great therapy sessions you know i was really back to absolute normal and so i would i would carry on the tour when we got back to la and all that sort of stuff but he said to me he said look i've got a phone call for you and he put the put me on the phone onto me and it was in the evening, you know, and he and I had got this voice on the other end of the phone. This is Elvis Aaron Presley, and <laughs> I, you make me feel like dancing. I'm going, what? <laughs> you know, it was, and I looked over at Michael, this guy, and he just nodded his head. Yeah, that's my boss. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God, Elvis. I said, do you realize how much a big fan? He said, well, do you know how what a fan I am of you? I've been playing your records all week, and, you know, oh. it's just great. You're, you're making me so happy, and I love the songs. And Michael says, you're a great guy. He said, look, I'm going to ask you. He said, do you, you don't have to be working yet. I've seen your schedule. And he said, would you like to come and hang out with me for a week? He said, maybe we can make some music. Maybe we can just hang out, talk. And he said, share some time together. You know, he said, I'd be honored. What do you think? And I said, try and stop me, you know. <laughs> so here's the thing. The next morning, I used to, I had this um, radio cassette machine, which was a rare a radio cassette recorder in those days. It was a Sony and it was yeah, ahead of its time, you know. And I used to record the radio, you know, listening to gospel and country and blues radio as you got it in the deep south down there. You know, it was, yeah. I got all these tapes still today the cassettes and cassettes that I recorded and that morning I was recording something on the radio while I was waiting for Michael to get all the stuff together I'd pack my suitcase really early and we were ready to go to Graceland you know and we would very the, nobody would know the press wouldn't know nobody yeah. would know we'd just sneak in there and I'd spend a week with Elvis it was fantastic you know um but then I as I was listening to the radio clicking the dial got to the news and they said the singer Elvis Presley has been brought dead on arrival to Memphis Baptist State Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I've got, still got that recording. Michael rushes into the room because he was listening to the radio from the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, my God, I've got to be with the family. He's making a phone call. He's got to go. Um, you know, he's got to go to Graceland. He gives, throws me the keys, lock up and leaves them, you know, in the, in the flatbed of the truck outside, you know, and, mm -hmm. or, you know, somewhere. <laughs> And just take, you know, get a cab to the airport. And that's what I did. And for years, I couldn't tell that story because nobody would bloody believe you, would they? No. You know, I'm the last person to talk. Why would Elvis want to speak to El Leo Sayer, you know? <laughs> and his fans are so kind of diehard. They, yeah. they protect him, you know? And I thought, I'm going to get hell for this. And I, so I didn't tell anybody. I just, a couple of people close to me, you know? Um, and I, I almost didn't believe it. But then, a few years later, you know, the producer, David Foster, who produced mm. Celine Dion and mm. all these amazing records, he came over to London with his girlfriend and requested to meet me. And I thought, well, this is nice. I mean, maybe he wants to produce me, you know, so, so yeah, I'll go with that. But I went to dinner with David and with him was Ginger Aldrin, who was Elvis's girlfriend at that final time when they were to, you know, when, when he died, she was the one who went to the bathroom and discovered him dead, you know? Um, and she, she, she hated planes. She hated flying, yeah. but she said, I had to come over with David to tell you how excited Elvis was 
to meet you. I've been holding this up for years. She said, and I'm stupid. I should have, I should have let you know earlier, but I'm telling you now. And, and, I, and I took this opportunity because David was coming to London for a meeting. I thought I'd, I'd join him because maybe we could find Leo and, and, you know, and David's publisher, of course, knew me. So, um, yeah, there, there we were. And she told me the whole story. And she said, you know, Elvis, the last words that Elvis spoke as he went to bed were, I'm seeing Leo tomorrow. You know, so, I mean, my God. So then I could tell the story. And I think I went on Lorraine TV and told the story. And there were still like 500 or so Elvis fans who said, no, nah, he's lying. He's lying. You know, made it up. So, I mean, what can you do, you know? Yeah. But it was he was incredible on the phone, amazing. And I know that we 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 really would have hit it off great. Yeah. Who knows? There might have been a Leo and Elvis album. Yeah. My life might have changed at that <laughs> moment. You know, we maybe have gone on tour together. Who knows? Yeah. It's strange that the fans, some of the fans didn't want to sort of accept that. It's not as if it's defamatory that it was. No, excited no, not at you. all. Not at all. But I think there the you know Obviously, there are people think that um, there's a sort of class structure sometimes mm-hmm. in music. You know, if Bruce Springsteen had gone down there, that, oh, that would be OK. You know, but yeah. who's Leo Sayer? You know, <laughs> so but I, that's OK. I mean, a few things like that have happened in my life. I mean, I'm still waiting for an Ivan Novello award with all the songs. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, 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 I'm not being humble here. You know, I'm just saying <laughs> that I think that I deserve those things with all the hits and everything. But mm. but things don't necessarily happen. I'm waiting for Glastonbury to invite me, you know, mm. um, it'll happen, I'm sure. I, I don't think my career is over yet, you know. Um, so sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and and go with things, you know. But it was definitely an amazing thing to to to, and and just a complete weird circumstance that brought me to talking to Elvis. Yeah. Well, is there anything else coming up for you after this album and tour? I suppose you've got your book coming out at some point. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I'm very close to the end and I think we'll be published kind of early to mid next year. Mm. So that will be Just a Boy, written by Gerard Sayer, who is like, you know, my real name because he's the only one who could keep tabs on what the crazy guy was doing. <laughs> Leo, you know, so so I, I decided to do it like that. And it's it, I think the book has been, I'm very proud of it so far. It's been great. I've been whittling away for the last five or six years on it, but um, it's going to be a goodie. And hopefully, I mean, if everything goes well, there could be TV rights with that or, if, yeah. you know, maybe a movie, who knows? Yeah, so um good. Because the funny thing is, although I'm 74, I'm, I feel like some of my best years are still ahead of me, yeah. you know, and um, I'm going back to America next year to tour. So that will that will be another um, uh, nice moment, you know, which I've not been able to succeed in going there for ages. But but now, you know, that's opening up for me again. And and um, it feels like the sky's the limit at the moment. You know, it's really good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, many thanks for joining us today. It's been a great pleasure. to have you on the absolutely. show. Great to be on Shout. Thank you very much, mate.